brothers do you recall when the grasslands reach to the horizon? And the deafening roar of countless wings overhead. Back when Rome was a village and Britain the Emerald Island. Before we gave up on our future and buried our dead. So it's episode five, and I've named it Shamanism, the people and their spirits. And before we get started, I would like to make some, de basically define some terms, because I think that is important, so that we understand what it is I'm talking about. So when I say magic in the context of this podcast, I'm referring to any um, mysticism and mystical practice that is not religion. When I say mysticism, I mean any practice that involves belief in that there exists another parallel reality to the one that is material that we all live in, that is also populated by entities or spirits. Now, when I say spirit in the context of this podcast, I am referring to any entity that is not material or physical. And it can be your invisible friend, it can be the boogeyman, it can be a ghost, or it can be the spirit of your dead grandmother. It can be a number of things, but any sort of entity that is not physically touchable, but nonetheless exists. And lastly, shamanism is a very kind of um, umbrella term. It's intended to define a lot of different phenomena over a lot of distance over the entire pretty much globe of our little planet. And that encompasses very many years, I mean, millennia and millennia. So for this, for the purpose of this podcast, shamanism is any sort of practice of mysticism that involves a human, a mediator, or an individual who serves as a vehicle, as a communicator with the other side, whose uh, primary goal, purpose, and skill is in communication with the other side. So that's the terminology. Now, Colin, this may be a little bit basic for you, actually for quite a few of you, but I'm just going to go over some basic concepts. So today's view of people's mystical practices really well there's the old view which is the one that i'm going to stick for because it's more of a classification and um, organization and definition sort of way to where you have such concepts as shamanism totemism animism and so on and so forth to where you have the division between uh, daemonism not demonism but daemonism as in daemons the same thing as spirits versus theology or religion. And then there's the very new uh, liberal concept of um, believing that each individual culture is completely unlike any other culture and that they have their own unique belief system, their own unique evolution of those belief systems and that, that they should never be compared to one another. While the second view may be closer to actuality for our purposes, since we're trying to discuss a concept, it's a lot more helpful to think of it as a, some sort of a system. That's why I'm giving it all of that umbrella term of shamanism. And why am I going to, uh, this is probably going to be more than one episode on this particular subject. And the reason why is because I believe that shamanism is something that is very much essential cornerstone to all of our modern beliefs, religions, cultural practices, ritualistic practices, superstitions, um, rit rituals, specific rituals, even in monotheistic, um, very modern, very cognitive and kind of rational um, religious and logical practices. It's in our mass media, it's in our culture, uh, in cartoons, movies, fears, children's tales, everything. So uh, understanding the concepts that lie behind all these mythical practices, shamanism, as I'm going to call it, I think is very essential for understanding the culture. I also think that um, the, the specific aspect of shamanism, and that is the animism, which is basically the belief that everything around us has a soul, a will, and a purpose, that everything, including an inanimate objects, is actually, a, in a way, a living creature or a living being. I think that's something that is very basic to human nature. It is something that children develop independently when they're playing with their toys. If you've ever seen you know, a child play with a favorite toy, if you've ever seen a 
a child play with a stick and or a bouncy ball and decide and suddenly give it a name and call it, let's say, a puppy. Um, people tend to give souls to objects that they interact with. One of my favorite quotes regarding this, and it's from the book, it's not very shamanistic, but the quote goes like this. Helicopters are the souls of dead tanks. And that's obviously veterans um, quote, and it's something that definitely refers to the situation where we have this deep-seated belief that objects around us, objects such as children's toys, such as, for example, a teapot that's been in your family for generations and generations, objects especially such as weapons and machines of war, tanks, swords, guns, they have a soul they have a personality and that they absorb or form that personality as a result of lengthy interaction with the human world. That they're capable of emotions, that they're capable of being hurt or being angry, that they can be helpful or incorporative, that they are beings just like me and you that one needs to be able to navigate the interactions with. So what is the main difference between religion and daemonism? Well, the main difference, the essential, the core difference is that in religion, you always have a situation where gods are beings from the other side that are basically the source of ethics, of laws, and of behavioral codes. In daemonism, that is not at all assumed. Because in daemonism, there is not the sense of inequality between the human beings and the creatures on the other side. To where gods are generally viewed as something that is inherently more powerful and more um, capable of influencing reality than any given individual. In daemonism and in shamanism, spirits are believed to be no different than the creatures that populate this world. Um, another thing that does not tend to happen in shamanism, now it can happen in individual cases, but specifically in individual cases, in daemonism, you do not worship the creatures from the other side. Now, you can come across a specific creature that you may decide to worship, but you might come across a specific person in this world, very material, that you may decide to worship as well. But that is not something that is a precondition of interacting with the other side. Because the creatures, the spirits, the entities on the other side, they are varied, they are many, and they go from amoeba level to very high, almost godlike creatures, as we will see are in some cultures. And your interaction with each individual creature, your individual interaction is going to be completely different than the next person's next to you. Because it depends with whom, on what day, under what circumstances, with what purpose, what intentions you are trying to interact. Um, and again, I already said that um, shamanism always, it, it precludes the idea that you have to have a human uh, conduit, a human um, practitioner, somebody who is particularly skilled, uh, talented at, and has been trained or has trained themselves, oftentimes trained, to interact with the other side in order to do it correctly. It is assumed that majority of human population is not capable of interacting with the other side, or if they do happen to interact with the other side, not being properly trained, uh, they are likely to wind up in disastrous circumstances. And let's see if there's anything else that I missed. Uh, yeah, and just the, the whole idea that, uh, you know, spirits are not good or bad. Spirits are just creatures. And for example, the exact same spirit by two neighboring tribes could, could be seen as a very positive and very protective entity. And by the next tribe over, it could be seen as a destructive evil entity. Well, it's because that spirit happens to be the protector of one tribe and the enemy of the other. So again, they're just like people, they're just like any other creatures. So, and another aspect of all mysticism, all mystical systems, at least, is that besides the natives of the other side, the other parallel reality that exists next to ours, and that is interconnected with ours. And that can actually influence the events in our material reality and vice versa. It's populated not only by the native spirits, but also by the souls of the dead human beings. Now, the role of those souls, the function of those souls, and the condition of those souls is vastly varied from one belief system to another. I mean, it can be that the souls might have their own individual section of the other side, they can become immediately deities on the other side, literally god godlike. For example, um, you know, in some of the later um, monotheistic religions, I mean, we know one very particular character who you know, became one with his father and ascended and became immediately a deity after having been a human being on this planet. 
Um, but um, a person could, a very powerful shaman and another belief system could die and through the suffering endured during death could completely lose all of his cohesion or her cohesion, lose all of their powers, all of their humanity, and basically appear on the other side as an equivalent of a plant and wind up having to be of that plan for a long duration of time. Not as a result of some sort of punishment in this deed, but just as a res result of having died and lost its kind of solid form understanding of reality just through the trauma of death itself. So what are spirits? Again, I already said that they are basically either native uh, inhabitants of the other side or they are mutated or literal souls of our dead ancestors. Um, now, there's different levels of these spirits. The other side is really populated by flora and fauna, just like this reality is. And when I say flora and fauna, I mean flora and fauna. Now, it's not in that. When I say I'm going to be using some animal examples, I do not mean that specific animal, that it's an I, I, identical copy of the animal we have here or planned, but it is an equivalent. It's their own version alien to us, parallel reality version of, for example, what would be moss on our plane. So for example, you can have spirit moss. Now you cannot do enough a lot of things with spirit moss. Spirit moss is a pretty in, unintelligent though plentiful material. But you, you cannot get it to do stuff for you. You cannot command it. You cannot tame it. You cannot threaten it. What you can do with it, for example, you can plant it around your dwelling so that it, if a spirit comes and tries to visit you while you're not there, it will leave footprints in this spirit moss so that you know that an enemy has come and visited you. Another useful thing that some, some uh, cultures specialize in, some specific individuals specialize in, is a bond, a kind of a, almost an empathic connection with various plant type substances in the spirit world. Where, for example, with the same moss, if you have an emotive connection with it, you could sense when it's being stepped on and therefore almost have like an alarm trigger system around your dwelling. It could be very useful to just burn out all the moss in any particular location. Maybe it is a poisonous moss, maybe it is a, some sort of a weed. But generally plant type level spirits are not very beneficial with some exceptions. Now the next level of spirits we have is what's an equivalent of an animal. Now a lot of native cultures, various native cultures, and my knowledge uh, really lies more with the Siberian and Ural people. But um, a lot of them believe that animals are equivalent to human beings, that they're not worse or better, but they're definitely different. And a lot of them believe that animals have their own shamans, that are animals who are specifically specialized on interacting with the other side as well. But on average, most animals in this world and most animals in the other world are not trained to interact with the respective other side. And most of them are different enough cognitively from human beings to where when you have a situation like possession, which is something that happens in our culture, even all the way to modern day, when you have uh, people trying to do, um, you know, expunging a, um, a deity or some sort of a spirit from an aff afflicted person. A lot of times when you hear about a, an entity, a person who has been possessed, you hear about them raving, them not being able to speak, making weird sounds, howling, running around, beating their head against the wall, acting in a completely incoherent manner. Well, that's because 99% of the time what happens is possession is an accidental possession by an equivalent of a dog or a cat from the other side. So what you're dealing with now is not a sentient being. You're dealing with a body of a human being with a terrified cat, for example, or a bird trap or moose trapped inside of it. And so it's not necessarily... Uh, destructive, it's just terrified and completely out of its comfort zone. That is an, also another reason why oftentimes a lot of the rituals that you will see sh various practices of shamans um, do is sometimes they will sit for hours and just say very repetitive kind of calming noises. Da, 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 na, 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 na. And the reason why you're doing that is because 99% of the time when shamans are interacting with the other side, it is the animal spirits that they are going to be interacting with. Why? Well, because animal spirits, you can tame them, you can get their loyalty, you can keep them chained, you can enslave an animal spirit, just like a person can trap, for example, um, I don't know, a wild horse and force it to do something. Um, they're easier to tame. I mean, just like with dogs, for example, their loyalty is much more assured than any sentient in human sense being. 
And uh, oftentimes when you're approaching a strange spirit, that is an animal spirit, what, what are you gonna do when you're approaching, for example, a horse or a deer that is frightened? You're gonna try to talk to it. Go, be quiet, it's okay, it's okay. I'm, don't be afraid, it's okay. I mean, you're no harm. And a lot of the actual chanting type repetitive actions that you will see is that kind of conversation with an animal on the other side. And now, of course, the most important um, level level of spirits that we have on the other side is ascension spirit, you know, higher level spirit. And that those are spirits that are as cogn cognitive or much more functional than normal human beings. Now, if one of those possesses you, there's a good chance nobody is going to find out that you've been possessed for a period of time, especially if it's a very intelligent spirit who decides to mimic the possessed person's behavior, for example. So while an animal possession is obvious immediately, you know, it's easy to treat and recognize um, possession by a higher spirit is something that sometimes can be very tricky and very difficult to detect unless somebody, you know, there's some minute details that you catch on to. Um, so where did these creatures, you know, where did these sentient beings on the other side, where did they come from? What's their origin story? Well, there is no agreement on that. I mean, all I can do is um, offer some interesting examples. For example, people of Ivenki, they believe that they evolved through biological evolution. In other words, they believe that originally the other side was populated by very simple organisms that over a period of time, through being growing more and more complex and developing and evolving, had first developed into animal type creatures and finally developed into higher sentient beings. I mean, believe it or not, but that's their belief system way before Darwin. Um, Yakuts believe that spirits, the highest spirits, are literally aliens that they're aliens and they were um, aliens that came to this reality and made humans into humans. Literally, they say that the sky cracked and they're called Ayuya, Ayuya, these higher spirits. And these Ayuya, they fell through from the crack in the sky into both uh, realities, both our reality and the parallel spirit reality. And that at first they existed in both and they were the ones who engineered, trained, tamed, directed and bred humans and spirits on the other side towards more sentient behavior. Now, over time, it became more and more difficult for them to maintain their presence on the, our side of reality. And so they pretty much left and now all exist on the other side with some exceptions. So these are basically elves, okay? These are Tol you know, Tolkien's classical elves who can no longer exist in our reality and have gone away into their own kind of spiritual realm but they still interact with our reality. They still maintain their separate, separatedness from all the other earthly beings. They're basically highly intelligent, very noble, very exemplary um, aliens with very benign intentions towards this world. Uh, Buryats is another uh, people's, uh, they believe that the world has always been as it, as it is now and it will always be as it is now. And all these things, creatures, animals, plants, uh, humans have always existed and nobody made them at all. David, did you want to jump in? Um, yeah. Okay. So, so what kind of relationship can a shaman have with a spirit? Well, first of all, if you're a non-shaman and you have a relationship with a spirit, um, yeah, I would not wish that upon anyone because a, a non-shaman typically does not know how to interact with a spirit. A non -sh I mean, that's where you get your poltergeists, you get your ghosts, you get your all kinds of unpleasant experiences. Uh, a spirit, for example, can... Yeah, when they sit on your chest, it's not fun. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, a spirit can follow you around and uh, the spirit can follow you around, for example, because it likes you. But you don't see it, you're not aware of its presence and it can influence events around you in such a way that is going to throw your life into com complete chaos. Um, Another, by the way, another big difference between um, religion and shaman, shamanistic system of beliefs is that in religion, you get miracles, right? You get these things where God goes, da-da, and everything goes, you know, a mountain moves or sea parts. You don't really get that as much in the shamanistic belief system. The spirits, they're mostly capable of influencing, unless they're super powerful ones, mostly capable of influencing this reality, either through their human uh, contacts or by very minute things. For I, I, I disagree completely. Okay, go I've ahead. Seen what you would call miracles happen with a shaman. Right, but did, did you just say that it happens with a shaman though? Yeah, a shaman can exercise power 
or, or, or channel power that it, it, you would call it a miracle. Okay, but would would that spirit be able to do the same, perform the same action if there was no shaman at all present by themselves? Sure. In fact, that's one thing that the shaman have to do. There are spirits on the other side that are bad, and the shaman has to get rid of them. That's what an exorcism is. That's that's the kind of thing. Okay, sorry, you just got off. Sorry, the the uh, the shaman can can uh, um, well, spirits can act on their own. Um, and sometimes there are bad spirits, and this is what the, sh the shamans have to do, the exorcism to get rid of them. Right, and that's, well, that's what I was talking about, that's possession. But can, for example, can a spirit just make, I don't know, a lake appear out of nowhere? Sure. Okay. If they're powerful, yeah. Okay, well, that, I guess that's something that's up for debate. I mean, from everything I've talked to people about, and what they said is that spirits are mostly capable of pushing events one way or another, but not actually... Deities can make an event that is unnatural, unlikely, and unexplainable happen. For example, make a lake appear out of nowhere in the middle of the desert. Um, yeah, it's, it's not, they're not usually big things like that. Um, yeah. But they're, they're, they can influence human behavior, especially if they are on the evil side. Right. To where spirits are more likely to make the wind blow a certain direction and bring the rain clouds to, over the desert, and then those rain clouds will dump. In other words, they're more organic with the flow of events. They, they cannot go completely supernaturally against the flow of events in the same way that deities, I generally believe, like they will not, cannot make a castle appear out of nowhere, out of thin air, or I don't know, feed people with one bread, you know, things like that. So that's what I'm getting at. I mean, it's a very fine line because a lot of those, uh, you know, demonistic beliefs and a lot of these animistic beliefs, they kind of flowed over into what be later became developed religions of various kinds and sit at the core of those. And then religions got layered and layered and layered on top of the original system of beliefs, I guess. But um, so what can you do with, uh, with spirits? One of the things you can do is you, I mean, if it's a plant spirit, I mean, really you can just grow it cultivated or destroyed, not much of anything, or you can connect with it and kind of resonate with it. Uh, with animals, you know, you can do a lot of things. You can have them as pets, you can have them as familiars, you can trap them, train them, uh, train them, um, command them. You can, uh, I mean, some of them are highly intelligent creatures. I mean, you know, if anybody ever had, a, I don't know, an adult terrier, it's, that's the dog you can send to the train station to meet your friend and, you know, walk him home. I mean, some of these spirits are highly intelligent. But nonetheless, these are animal companions. They are either out of loyalty, love, or by force, they serve you, and that they are fairly easy to control. Majority of shamans really deals with these level of spirits. Now, the highest level, the most coveted level of spirits, and at the same time, most difficult and dangerous level of spirits to interact with is going to be your sapient spirits, your intelligent spirits. Um, so what can you do with the sap sapient uh, spirits? Well, first of all, you can serve them, right? That's probably the worst possible scenario. That's not very good. If you have a spirit that you serve, yeah, you're, it's not good to be you. I would not want to be you at all because we don't know what kind. I mean, if it's a very benevolent, wise, and very um, trustworthy spirit, then sure, why not? I mean, you can serve them. That's not a problem. But, um, you know, how many ben benevolent, completely um, fair, wise people do you find? I mean, that's your chances of finding a spirit that's like that great are about equal. So, the idea of having to serve a spirit is more or less not in your favor. Next thing you can do with them, you could be equals. And that's, you know, that's probably the best, the most ideal uh, sort of a relationship where you either partners, companions, I mean, by partners, I mean partners in your pursuits, companions, um, friends, even uh, when you have common goals or you operate according to a contract or an understanding uh, where you operate with mutual respect and for or for and or for mutual benefit towards a common goal. Now, this is a fairly complex relationship because with that, you know, comes, comes your kind of game of thrones sort of situation. Another thing is that this is a very um, investment intensive relationship because these in, intelligent higher level spirits, they are very curious, but they kind of are a little bit, um, they have a little bit of ADD and you need to constantly be in contact with your companion or your friend spirit. Another thing is that time and space on the other side, they don't ex exactly coincide to this side. So for example, you know, if you're not constantly talking to your friend spirit, he might think that a couple of minutes have passed, except you have died, you know, your children have died, your grandchildren have died, and then he will suddenly remember about, oh, I had a best friend somewhere. 
he's going to go looking for you and be very, very sad when he finds your great, great, great grandchildren and probably be very nice to them, you know, out of kindness and memory towards you, but that doesn't do you any good. So you always want to keep in touch. You want to, they're very curious to them. This reality is almost like a soap opera. It's something that's different from their world. They want to know what's going on. And how do you keep in touch with your spirit? Well, you talk to it. You talk to it. You tell it stories. You uh, share. I mean, they very much want to know about what's going on in human life. And even things that to us may be very kind of benign. Or oh, the snow fell. You know, spring has begun. You flowers opened up. A squirrel, squirrel ran by. I mean, even things like that might be exciting and different to them because it's so different than what's going on, on their, in their reality. Next kind of relationship you can have. Um, is the story, um, oh, and I had to actually, I have little side stories I want to tell you. So the story of a partnership, the kind of mutual relationship with a spirit is um, Tungusas. It's a tribe of peoples called Tungusas, and they have their founding stories, the story of the old, yeah, I'm going to try to pronounce this, pronounce this, old Yechum. And that was a shaman who saved their whole tribe there early on when they were just first forming from an awful vengeful spirit. Their tribe had this horrible madness cast upon them. Generation after generation, whatever they did, wherever they moved, people in their tribe would just go absolutely insane. And they could not figure out what was going on and why this horrible misfortune was pursuing their people. And so that's when Yehom came and uh, he went into the spiritual world and he came in contact with a spirit that was very, very angry. The spirit was very angry because many generations back, the founding mother of this tribe, she seduced the spirit, made him some promises, and skedaddled without fulfilling any of those promises. He felt very cheated, very mistreated. I mean, she was basically cocktease. And uh, he was very angry, and he was trying to punish her. Well, the shaman who came to the other side, he explained to the spirit that, hey, listen, she's long since dead. Her children are dead. Her grandchildren are dead. And you're pursuing these peer, poor people who have nothing to do with what happened to you. I mean, she, yes, she entrapped you. She forced you to do some favors for her and then just pretty much ditched you. But you're punishing people who are completely innocent. And in this case, the spirit turned out to be actually a very benign and kind spirit. And he felt really bad. So he became a protector spirit of the tribe. And he also became a companion spirit of the shaman who kind of explained to him the situation and stopped him from doing more evil to people who were not guilty. So that's kind of one of the side stories. Now, if you are a super badass, super powerful shaman, who really likes to gamble with your life and everything you love, there's another way you can interact with the spirits, with spirit world. You can force these sentient beings to serve you. Now, there are two different ways they can serve you. One is actually voluntary servitude. For example, you walk into the forest and you hear it, feel, sense a disturbance in the other side. So you go to the other side and you notice that there is a great spirit or a lesser spirit that had a tree fall in it. Well, you free the spirit and the spirit is very grateful to you. And so the spirit says, look, I'm very grateful to you. I will serve you for X amount of time, you know, to show you my gratitude. And, you know, I, or I will do these things for you. For example, I'm willing to help you with anything but kill people. Or I'm willing to help you with anything if you never have asked me to go into a fire. Um, or if you never summon me at night after dark. So usually when it's a voluntary servitude, it's, 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 it's temporary and it's contractual. And if, and if you somehow violate the terms of that contract, you're going to be in real trouble. That's your proverbial kind of genie story. When you, somebody summons a genie or some, someone summons a demon of some sorts that they want to perform certain functions under the contract. And if you violate the terms of those contracts, uh, yeah, lawsuits will seem like very easy and fun stuff to you after what that spirit is going to do to you for violating the terms. Now, if you're really bad, bad, bad shaman, Bad in the sense that you just found it. You can actually enslave a sentient spirit, even a very powerful sentient spirit. And if you're a very, very powerful shaman, you can entrap and force the spirit to serve you, a very powerful spirit to serve you and do your bidding, either through force, through intimidation, through trickery, or in any number of ways. And yes, you're going to be super powerful. It's going to be great, except for one thing. Sooner or later, that spirit is going to break free. And they're going to hate you all the way. They will do your bidding. They will give you great powers. But when that spirit breaks free, or when you, the shaman who happens to be mortal, happens to die, guess who's going to be waiting for you on the other side? Eagerly like waiting, you know, excited like waiting, ready to, you know, welcome you to the other side. 
in the whatever form they want you to be in and you know make you suffer for the next 10,000 years um, so yeah if you want to gamble your future and the future of your entire lineage go right ahead and entrap those powerful spirits but it's probably a very danger dan dangerous ga uh, gamble and there's actually a story um, Hanta Mansi, which is a Finno-Ugoric group tribe that currently lives in ter territory of Russia, they have a story of Asuka. And Asuka was a shaman warrior, which is very rare. Actually, most of the time, shaman and a warrior are two separate functions within a tribe. Oftentimes, they are, at least in Mongols and a lot of Siberian tribes, that is the Pretty case. Common, well, and, and it, it does happen, but generally, if you focus on the other world, you should not be involved in politics in this world. I mean, you can only like follow politics in one or the other reality. I mean, if, you, if you're super powerful and you can do politics in both worlds at the same time and be the leader here and on top of it all, be the political leader in the other world, then you're Genghis Khan pretty much, you know, or Caesar. And then you're just great and wonderful. Majority of people just don't have the talent to combine the two functions. But some do, so go ahead. There are warriors who are on the uh, shamanic path who find that uh, they work together and not separate. I guess, and you're right, and that says, yeah, a warrior can be in shaman, on a shamanic path, but what I'm talking about is like the lead shaman of a group. In other words, if, you, if you're the leader of the church, you pro, it's not typical for you to be the leader of the armies. It does happen. That, not that happen. depends on no. the people. I know they, for the Gwich'in in northern Canada and Alaska, um, they have the people that are the bear clan. They're the people that become the shaman, in, in our word, and they also become the chiefs. So, like, my ex was actually both. Huh. That's interesting because in Mongols, for example, like the traditional Mongols, like Genghis is considered to be unicum in that sense. Well, Genghis was not a, actually a practicing shaman, but he, his gift was considered to be so powerful that it came through anyway. And he was, Mongols thought that he was fairly, well, him and his couple of his descendants uh, were fairly unique in the sense that they were both, you know, huge leaders of a large nation, I mean, enormous nation, and at the same time be practicing shamans. But um, since that lineage has, more or less stopped being so prominent that that's something that's just not done, for example, in any of the descendants of the Mongolian people as far as I'm aware at this point in time. But I think it's, I think it's just, it's probably just depends on your individual talent. If you are capable of multitasking and doing all of the above, why not? I mean, there's no prohibition against it. But anyway, um, so this As As Asuka, he was a warrior and he was um, uniting his people against the advance of the Kazakhs, you know, in the Russian territory. And it was, he was kind of like the native fighter against the advance of the civilization and he was super successful. And the reason why he was super successful is because he had three very powerful spirits that he has entrapped and made his slaves. And these spirits, they, he could send them into enemy territory, you know, do recognizance, let him know what the enemy was planning to do, what was about to happen. And um, they would come back and tell him all this information. They would report his eyes, they were his ears. They, you know, explained the strategy of the an enemy. And so his rebellion, his kind of fight for their native rights was very, very success successful. Well, he also had a beloved daughter. And the daughter was, she had the, the shamanistic gift, but he chose not to train her properly as a shaman because he did not think that the other side would be very safe for his little girl. And he did not want her to meddle with it. So he just wanted her to grow up a normal person, to wind up having children, get married, and have a good life. Well, this daughter started having dreams every night. You know, beautiful young men would come to her and profess his love and do unspeakable, lo lovely things to her all night long and beg for her to pick him and be his wife. Then another young man would come to her and do the same thing, re repeat. And so all three of them kept coming to her and entreating her and professing their love to her, these three beautiful young men, until she just did not know what to do anymore. And that's when all three of them came to her and they said, look, we love you. All three of us will love you. We will give you all the power. We will give you eternal youth. But you have to do something for us. You need to pick which one of us you love truly. So we do not squabble among ourselves anymore. So we, our hearts are not broken. You need to choose your beloved, your chosen husband. And to do this, you need to sneak into your father's tent and take a golden pin out of his clothing and bring it to a certain mountain top at a certain time and give it to the one that is your chosen one. Well, she was smitten by one of the spirits and she went and she got the golden pin and she went to the mountain top. And in the morning, they found her pretty much completely in a vegetable state. She was completely irre irrevocably, irre irreversibly insane and just basically vegetable. Her father, 
who at this point in time has lost control of the three spirits that have been serving her, serving him, because that pin was one of the items that helped him keep them in control. He spent seven days and seven nights bedridden, fighting um, a battle on the other side to try to prevent these creatures from destroying him as well and destroying all his people. He was a very powerful shaman. He was able to chase these spirits off. He made them go away, but he no longer had his servants. And he no longer had his eyes and ears. And of course, the whole rebellion collapsed. And he was so devastated by the loss of his beloved daughter, who was never the same again, that he just wound up surrendering, surrendering and signing a peace. So the moral of the story, if you have powerful creatures serving you, be very careful about what people around you do. They just watch you back. And if you have a child that has the shamanistic um, gift, you probably would be smart to educate them on how to handle it properly and what to do with it. So it's, it's one of those stories that is told. Now, the most interesting relationship and most complicated and dangerous relationship one can have with a spirit is uh, marriage or what's called, you know, shamanistic spouse or in different cultures it's called different things, but you can have a romantic relationship with a creature from the other side. Now, these spirits, they, they can come off as human beings. They can take on the form of human beings. And oftentimes when they're seducing somebody, they will take on the form of a human being, more over the human being that you desire most, of whatever gender, whatever appearance you prefer. But their natural form is not the same as human form. I mean, this creature could be, I don't know, it's centipede with a huge lion's tail and glowing wings. Um, it could be the size of a mountain, or it could be as tiny as your fingernail. But they will take on the form of whatever it is your most desired sexual partner to be with you when they're seducing you. And if you have a relationship with a spirit, it's no different than having a relationship with anybody else. Except these spirits, they are going to be around you all the time. They're going to help you every way. They're going to totally believe in your power and support you. They're fairly sincere and passionate in their affections. By the same token, they are going to want to spend a lot of time with you. Yes, they will be there when you die on the other side and they will welcome you and they will help you over, for real, help you over to the other side and make you, you know, your kind of acclimatization to the, to the new world very easy. But while you're alive, good luck going to the other side and talking to any other spirits at all. Because if, hey, if you came over here, what, did you come over here to hang out with me or go hang out with all these other people? I mean, your chances of having growing as a shaman, of developing, I mean, you can have a dog spirit, but any other sentient spirits, nope. These things are jealous. These things are very jealous, not only of other spirits, but also of other people. Um, so if you are a shaman with that kind of relationship and you meet a woman or a man, depending on your, or on your preference and sex, uh, that you have feelings for, that spirit is going to make their life absolute disaster. That spirit is going to want to have sex with you a lot all the time. So guess what? Every time you go to bed and you fall, fall asleep, they, every time you daydream, every time you hallucinate, guess what you're going to be doing? A lot, all the time, 24-7 and nothing else. Um, these things, um, they, um, it can get to the point where they can pretty much, I mean, everybody heard about stalkers. Well, now imagine you have a super powerful spirit of the mountain that's stalking you day and night and relentlessly does not even understand any of the human morality does not you cannot get a restraining order against it i mean phantom of the opera <coughs> is, is a very happy story of a girl who had a spirit fall in love with her now that was a very sensible reasonable spirit she was super lucky because after a bunch of people had very unpleasant experiences she was able to explain to him that look you know that's not going to work out and he was reasonable about the whole thing there is a very interesting story um uh, that um, Halka Mongols, which are the Mongols, Mongols, they have these um, shaman, um, their kind of central shaman, who is a very legendary and a very terrifying figure. Now, his name is uh, Tanjan Bo, and Bo means dark shaman. Now, dark shaman and light shaman, it's not good or bad. I mean, different tribes call it different things, but in generally, there's one category of If there is a split in types of shaman, there's one category who influences the other side and the spirits mostly by negotiating with them, seducing them, um, bribing them, and in other words, trying to be, um, trying to convince them. And then the dark shamans, those are the light shamans. Now the dark shamans, 
they do use brute force. They will threaten, they will, um, they will frighten, they will, you know, hit, punish and injure and in other ways physically impact the spirits on the other side. They're very controlling, they're very forceful. So even though they're not necessarily evil as people, sometimes that kind of tendency towards the force and violence can translate into a more unpleasant character, you know, in, in a human sense. So Tanjin Bo, or Tanjin, he was a very, he's a legendary, terrifying, dark shaman. And he was just an evil man. I mean, he was a very nasty individual. People were terrified of him. He was super powerful. We'll talk about some of his teaching methods later on. But he, he was a homosexual man, and he had a very close relationship with um, uh, Spirit of the River Carolyn, um, which is one of the largest uh, rivers in that region. And it was a super powerful spirit. Also very dark, very violent, very masculine spirit. And the way that they two got together is actually there was a year where the river was start, starting to dry up because the spirit just didn't feel like tending to the river. And so the shaman went in to try to force the spirit to perform his duties. And they fought and they fought and they fought for several days and several nights. And the battle was so fierce and it was so intense that eventually it just kind of switched over into really violent, intense and passionate sex. And so they became lovers. And throughout the life of Tangent, you know, Carolyn was always his companion, his lover, his other half. I mean, they were very close. And, um, but when he was younger, Tangent had a normal heterosexual relationship with a woman, a very short one, but from that relationship, uh, a son was born. And so in his old age, you know, very lonely, very scary, very evil man. He got lonely and he went and he looked up his son and it turned out that his son was also a shaman, but his son was a light shaman. And he brought his son back with him and he started teaching his son. And over time, he developed just a very tender, very sincere, loving father-son relationship with, with his son because he was just a lonely uh, old man whom everybody hated and feared. And he started gr growing closer and closer to his son. And the kid was like in his 20s at that point in time, right? And of course, of course after a while, Carolyn got very jealous of this relationship. He felt that his lover is turning away from the dark side, that he's becoming, you know, all too soft, too, you know, lovey-dovey with, with his offspring. Now, the son had a wife who was a very weak, just barely shaman at all, but whom the son really loved. And Carolyn got this plan. He actually possessed the wife, and he wanted to drive the son insane, so the son would just be out of the picture. So he possessed the wife, and uh, when the kid was having sex with his, with his wife one night, she opened her eyes basically and said, hi, I'm not your wife, I'm Carolyn, and your wife's soul is pretty much mine and she's dead. Well, the son really loved the wife and he got very upset and he, right then and there, his whole talent switched over. He went to the dark side, he attacked Carolyn, he wanted his wife back and he started fighting the spirit and they fought several days and several nights and who can guess what happened next? Carolyn fell in love with the kid. Now, the kid was able to get his wife's soul back, but she was still unwell, and he had wanted to have nothing to do with the spirit who has invaded his wife's body. So he grabbed his wife, and he was running off to Tibet to try to find some healers who could help her. Now, chasing after him across the mountain path in a very soap opera kind of way was a completely fired up with passion, desire, and just adoration was the spirit of Carolyn. And chasing after all of them, was very angry, very betrayed feeling, old Tanjin, who felt, ah, so this kid came to me so he could steal my lover, so he could destroy my relationship, and he wanted to kill them all. And so at some snowy overpass, somewhere near Tibet, it all came to a head. Um, Tanjin caught up with them, and he fought with Carolyn, and well, first he fought with his son. He fought with Carolyn, and uh, his son stepped in, and after a lengthy battle, his son was able to kill his father. He killed his father not only in our world, he killed his father in the spiritual world. Now spirits, they can't really die. They, they can be swallowed, consumed, but they can't really die in the same way that material creatures can die, but they can be reduced to almost a protoplasm state to where they're almost non-entities, to where they, they be, all their power can be taken away from them, to where they stop being even coherent, anything. And this is what happened to old Tangent. He got destroyed to the point where he just, he faded into the other side and just vanish somewhere and you know like little leaf in the grass and when carolyn saw all that and he saw his old lover you know his lover and companion of so many years just disintegrating into nothing it dawned on him what happened to him 
what he has done. And he left the kid alone and he went into, on, back to the other side and he went searching for his old lover, uh, you know, giving an oath that he's going to find him and stay with him for as long as it will take for him to come back to his senses to regain his magical powers. Well, the son was able to take his wife up to that bed, he was able to actually cure her. And then he came back to the shores of the actual river, Carolan, which has been uh, completely abandoned by the spirit, its guardian spirit. And him and his descendants wound up sitting on the shore of that river for the next 300 plus years and performing the functions of the spirit who was in the other, on the other side trying to save his father. That's kind of an interesting story from the Mongols that shows you basically how complicated some of these relationships can get. Um, so what else was I gonna say? So another thing that can happen if you really, really love a spirit, or if a spirit really, really, truly loves you with all his or her heart, you can have material children. You can have physical, material children in either one of the partners, the human partner or the spirit partner can actually become pregnant and deliver the baby. Now, this is rare. This is, this is where a lot of your legendary uh, conceptions come from. For example, uh, the, the uh, mother spirit of all Mongols or your Merovings, you know, when you have a spirit that has a relationship with, a, for example, a human man, and then nine months later, she appears and delivers the baby and leaves it with the father. And that's how some of your dynasties, for example, in Middle Ages, Europe were founded. Um, it's a very rare and very hard to maintain process because, for example, if a spirit, if, if a person is pregnant, you know, a person could be, and by the way, either guy or girl can be pregnant with a spirit child in, in this reality. But you can be pregnant for seven years because um, the time to, of gestation in the spirit world does not necessarily equate the same thing here. But if a spirit, for example, is pregnant, you have to expand your, expand your energy and maintain her in this neither place that is not in our reality, not in their reality, but somewhere in between where an immaterial entity can actually bring a child to the point where it can be born. And again, it can be seven years, it can be 20 years, but it does occasionally happen. And uh, it's one of the kind of the most more um, mythologized, you know, more legendary stories that occur like that when you have this miracle child. And I think some of the medieval folklore about the, you know, the child of destiny come from that particular um, sort of concept. I'm gonna, I've been going on for a minute. Does anybody want to say anything? Can everybody hear me? All right, I just wanna to touch on a, a little more classic anthropological definitions of shamanism. Um, Shamanism is basically a practitioner who enters the spirit world uh, and there's it's based on this concept that as as uh, you were just saying that um, there's a spiritual world that underlies that the, that the real world if you will is the spiritual uh, world that underlies this one and that's how shamanism works right and and that sham that that's how shamanism works because even the sources of physical illness tend to be have spiritual causes right very much uh, kind of like a lining to a coat yes very much um Another thing in classical anthropology anyway, uh, from again, many decades ago, um, there was a distinction between uh, shamanism and possession trance, shamanic trance and, and possession trance. Um, possession trance tends to be uh, more female in nature, uh, females tend to, and the practitioner is like the witch doctor outside, uh, who, who, who guides the uh, spirit into an individual. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of modern religion, the, the big religions are a, a an expansion of that, if you will. Uh, the Holy Spirit coming into you and possessing you or, or that kind of thing. 
Um, whereas shamanism is much more about not uh, providing answers as seeking answers. Um, and in closing here, I'd just like to point out uh, a difference between traditional shaman out of uh, various particular cultures and how they have culture, the whole cultural backing uh, and what we would call neo-shamanism of this day and age where um, you don't really like what I practice basically. Uh, I don't have those years of in-depth traditions that that are fully supported by the culture. Like in one of the Andean, and I can't remember what group it was, uh, but when they would take hallucinogenic uh, trances and all experience the same interactions with their jaguar motif, which and and it would be a cultural a shared cultural experience it's hard to get that kind of depth in neo uh, shamanism you there are some advantages you can draw from a whole lot more different traditions and and find value in those but at that same depth it just is not quite as powerful that's that's pretty much what I Yeah, her, grand, her grandmother. And in fact, uh, if she was going to do a, a healing medicine for someone and wasn't quite sure of the ingredients, she would talk to her grandmother. Now, the fact that her grandmother has been dead for quite a few years didn't make any difference to the communication. And in fact, she would even go back further if she needed to. Um, such a, a communicating with others. Okay, well, we lost Colin. But not everybody on the other side, because her idea of like the her understanding of, of the spirit world, as we would call it, is quite a bit a bit different than what you you were talking about. Like a spirit is basically um, a person that's died and gone on. Not all of which can communicate with the, this world. There are also on the other side there are bad creatures like demons, and she called them jinns, which are a, a lesser demon, um, which she had to deal with quite a bit. But um, and the idea of an animal spirit, animals have spirits, but there's no such thing as an animal spirit in the way you were talking about. Like our, our inanimate objects, like rocks and things don't have spirits, but, a, but an inanimate object can be imbued with a spirit. And so she would fairly regularly destroy things in our house because they had like things were put in them or go into a store and, and clean the store, that kind of thing. So, but this is very traditional stuff that goes back thousands of years. No, I mean, and this is just the, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is just the introductory episode. I kind of wanted to give a very broad definition of what it is we're dealing with. It varies greatly from one culture to another, greatly, greatly. Each culture has their own tradition, but there are certain things that are similar enough to where you can unite at least into a very loose kind of um, similar category. A lot of these practices, anywhere from, you know, North America to Siberia to Asia to Thailand uh, and I don't know, like some even you know Japanese tradition to uh, Africa to uh, to Aboriginal to just about anywhere else. I mean, the variety is enormous. There's so many different ways, so many different takes, so many different systems of beliefs, uh, but some things are the same. And you know, each each um, particular culture has its own view of what a soul is, because and that's what I want to talk about in the next one: was what is a human soul. Because from culture to culture, it is anything from as simple as what we have today in the um, modern monotheistic paradigm to something that is so complex that you, it makes ancient Egyptian concept of um, a person's soul look very simple. And where the souls go and what function they serve and whether they're alone or they're joined by other entities in reality it just really varies from culture to culture for sure. Anybody else? I was going to just uh, interject uh, one thing on that note that you just made, and then I was going to comment on something that David said. But um, like, yeah, it, a lot of it is very similar, even in, I don't know very much about African culture, but um, the concepts that you were talking about, about our world, and then the uh, spirit world, um, there are Asian cultures that it might not even be that traditional, but like in modern Japanese culture, they have 
endless, endless stories about that. I mean, it's, it's an underlying theme for some of the most popular uh, animes and stuff like uh, Holic. It's all about uh, the, the witch who uh, can grant wishes and, you know, there's the spirit world and then there's the other world and, you know, there's the gateway, which I think is very interesting in that story. But then um, about what David said, um, the whole uh, kind of like a, a collective uh, group experience it's maybe a little bit more difficult now for people that practice uh, shamanic religions. I am really fascinated by all the stories and all of the uh, accounts that I've read about some South American tribes that continue to practice their old shamanic uh, religions, or not religion really, but their ways. And uh, specifically with the, uh, um, the traditional ritual of taking uh, ayahuasca or yahe. Pretty much, you can uh, drive out from New York City and go down into the uh, South American jungle and sit with these people and take yahe. And then after you're done puking your guts out and whatever, and you actually take the journey, you see a lot of the similar things to what they are experiencing. You, you see a lot of the same symbols. You probably see the cat and the snake and other aspects of the jungle, you might actually be able to communicate with spirits. I don't, I've never taken Yahe, so I wouldn't know. But apparently, many people just have a very similar experience in that ceremony. And I don't know if it's just the nature of the drug. I couldn't tell you. But I thought that was very interesting. Well, that's, that's the one thing that, that the, the seminary I went to, we had three different major branches of, of Christianity, and we discovered we're about 98% the same. It seems that different religions are different ways of looking at basically the same thing. Um, and so, it, like, one person's experience might be a little bit different than another, but the underlying stuff is there. Like, this, the spirit world, it's common amongst all cultures. There's different ways of looking at it, but it, almost everyone recognizes that it's there, except for the very modern. Yeah, well, and I think there's two ways of looking at it. I mean, I'm supernatural. They, you know, they, your, your color of paint. Like as an example, uh, my my, I was a, a sponsor of my ex's um, baptism. She became Christian, but she didn't change any of her old her old religion at all. She said it was like going from watching a movie in black and white to watching a movie in color. Everything was basically the same. It's just more in depth. So the, you know, all these different religions are actually very similar. Well, you know, and I think there's two ways of really looking at it. I mean, you know, and I was, I was actually, I think, talking to Jake about it. I mean, when you have, and I'm going to use a very kind of cliche example, when you have a situation when you have a, a man wearing a bear skin, jumping around a fire, okay, you can look, people within the tribe of that individual, within that culture, might see a man actually taking on the shape of a bear. An anthropologist who is visiting that tribe, um, who is a very modernist, maybe even a uh, you know, atheist watching the same exact scene might think that, you know, there's a man in a bear skin jumping around. Which one of the two is true, right? I mean, so there's different ways of looking at this. I mean, you can look at it from the point of view, like my belief system personally is probably closer to the shamanistic belief system, though I'm not in, in any way related to any shaman, shamanistic cultures or traditions, to where I believe that reality is complex, it's multi-layered and it's fluid. And a lot of things can be more than one thing at, at once. But you can look at it from a very rational, scientific approach. I mean, human brain is only wired in so many ways, and there are only so many combinations you can really get out of certain experiences. Um, if all the people are part of the same culture and they think in the same paradigms and they think about the similar subjects because day in and day out, they're doing very similar activities, their association, um, association's potential is gonna be limited to a certain number of, you know, of the animals they're familiar with, of the worries that you know, are common for that population of the uh, traditions that they're common, commonly experiencing. Another lady whom I'm gonna bring up later on, Barkova, she is a mythologist, she studies actually, she's a folklorist and a mythologist. She had an interesting theory when she was younger, which she denounced since, but I think it's actually a very good theory, you know, because people throughout history have spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time and a lot of physical and psychological effort practicing these rituals. People back then were not stupid, especially the, the, the very early days when really your time was very much dedicated and your effort was very much reserved for survival related tasks, right? And yet people would spend up to 75% of their daily time on practicing the same rituals. Why would they do this behavior if it was not beneficial in any way, shape or form? Well, her theory was that 
when you have a whole culture, whole community that in which every single individual wholeheartedly believes in functionality of a ritual, and every one of them contributes emotionally, psychologically, physically, and even psychically in a way to the benefit of that um, ritual. I mean, one of the two things, either it's self, um, almost like self-fulfilling prophecy, self-hypnosis, and mutual, almost moving of the events in a certain desired way because everybody is trying to perform all the maximal actions in order for it to happen the way that they want. Or you can almost, almost look at it as a magical battery. And the moment you start introducing elements that are foreign to that society, when you get one disbeliever, it's still going to function. When you get two disbelievers, it's still going to function. When the number of dis dis uh, disbelievers goes up to 50% and more, the whole mechanism is going to start breaking down. And in modern society, which mo mainly consists of really people who do not believe, the likelihood of these same rituals that work like clockwork for thousands of years actually doing anything are very low. Now, this is a very mystical, not anti-scientific kind of thought process, but it's something that, you know, is interesting to think about and consider. Well, I just want to finish up before I let everybody go, just with, uh, you know, you brought up, Ryan, you brought up some uh, Japanese uh, anime, and I just want to recommend some uh, cartoons for people who may not be present necessarily right now, but might be watching this video later. Um, the Last Unicorn is an interesting take on that kind of a very fluid, very different reality than ours. Um, Mummy Troll and the Winter Magic, not as popular it, it, here in the United States as, as it is in Europe. Mummy Troll and the Winter Magic is a very interesting story, very interesting take that's purely shamanistic in its nature. It's straight up a sham, shamanistic story. And then out of the very classical Japan animation uh, is uh, Princess Mononoke and my neighbor Totoro. And those are two um, films, animated films, that are pro probably as shamanistic as you're going to get in their whole concept and animistic as you're going to get. And I think that's about it. Oh, you know what? I didn't do a shout out to Marwine. Marwine, thank you for letting me use your material. Thank you, guys. that exist within every man's soul. Every man's and we soul. will live forever or as long as stories are told. Stories are told. Stories we are the are archetypes that exist within every man's soul.